Hello and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Good afternoon, we're so glad you're here. This afternoon's event is a part of the analytical work that we do here at CSIS on global food security, which includes looking at the role of the US government to address hunger, poverty, and malnutrition outside of our borders. I'm often asked if the United States is still a global leader in ending hunger under President Trump's America First agenda. My answer is always absolutely, we still are. I'm also asked a lot about the actual impact of U.S. foreign assistance, particularly in the countries that are a part of the U.S. global food security strategy. That's a more nuanced answer for me, but my elevator answer is that there has been transformative impact within targeted communities. In February this year, I led a congressional staff delegation trip to Ghana. We wanted to look at US-funded agriculture and nutrition programs. We talked with USAID, USDA, State Department, Peace Corps, and of course the many implementing partners that are doing the work on the ground. And I'd like to take a moment, moment to thank Jennifer Cook. I was looking for her in the audience and I don't think I see her yet. I know she'll be coming later, but Jennifer Cook is the one who authored this trip report that some of you got whenever you checked in this afternoon. Um, it was the second congressional trip that Jennifer and I have done together here and actually one of the final products that she authored as the now former director of the CSIS Africa program. After two decades with CSIS, Jennifer has moved on and I can tell you she's greatly missed. Next month she'll become the director of the African Studies at the George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. And I just want to thank Jennifer because I know she'll be coming in soon um, for her brilliant insights and clear writing. Um, the trip we saw a lot and it's hard to sort of tease out and then weave together observations and she did that very well. Today's event though is it's really not about the Ghana trip or our report but I wanted to bring out a few points that that we talked about in Ghana and also that rel are relevant to the bigger picture and to the discussion for today. And one is that Feed the Future's numbers are impressive. Um, the cumulative impact of the initiative over the years is improving lives. Poverty levels are dropping, children are more nourished, smallholder farmers are empowered, agriculture research and development is advancing, and I'm sure many of our speakers will go into more details and discuss those numbers. I'd also like to point out that both inclusive agriculture growth and reaching the most vulnerable are important and possible. The new country strategies that the new Feed the Future programs are working on, or Feed the Future target countries, they have to work on balancing those interventions between market-driven and resilience-focused. And you'll notice, and I'm sure Beth will allude to this, that the global food security strategy, as well as the proposed reorganization of USAID, has really um, taken resilience up a level. And that's a good thing, and I'd like to see more of that. I also want to point out about agriculture research and development. It's vital work and one that I think is often overlooked. Um, this includes work of the Feed the Future Innovation Labs, as well as fellowship programs, because in order for us to meet the immediate threats of pests and disease like fall armyworm, um, we need this, as well as to build the capacity of future ag scientists. So today's program, we're going to hear from two members of Congress who understand the importance of America's commitment to fight hunger and poverty. Representative Betty McCollum is a Democrat and Representative Chris Smith is a Republican, but they're both co-sponsors uh, for a three-year reauthorization of the Bipartisan Global Food Security Act. And by the way, they both also had members of their staff with us on this trip to Ghana that we took this year. I very much look forward to the remarks and talking with them afterwards. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Congresswoman Betty McCollum. She's had a long career in public service, rising from city council to Minnesota House of Representatives to being elected to serve in Congress. And since 2000, she's represented Minnesota's fourth district of the United States House of Representatives. I said that wrong. <laughs> since 2000, she's represented Minnesota's fourth district in the United States House of Representatives. And she's worked on issues ranging from education to empowerment or to environment. Um, she's a member of the House Appropriations Committee, and I would call her a congressional champion for global food security. Congresswoman McCollum. Well, good afternoon. Coming from farm country, days like today are what farmers live for, are they not? Um, I want to thank uh, Kimberly, and I'd like to thank uh, 
uh, CSIS for the invitation to be here today and for all of you who are engaged in this project, whether you're reporting on it so more people hear about it or you've been one of the, the many, many people behind the scenes helping with the success. And it, it truly is an honor because I do believe this is an important dialogue. But I was just sitting alongside uh, my colleague, Congressman Chris Smith. He's been a leader and a partner. When I first got elected to Congress, he was on the uh, chairing up, leading up the African subcommittee uh, when I was on foreign, uh, foreign relations uh, um, authorization. And he has just been a great partner uh, on global food security and a person who's been working on this for a long uh, time. Well, it's been two years, two year anniversary, when President Obama signed the Global Food Security Act into law. And right now, uh, Chris will update you more on it, but the Foreign Affairs Committee is hard at work and they're gonna make sure that this critical uh, authorization moves forward once again. But as an anniversary approaches, isn't it a good time to kind of reflect? I mean, we have to celebrate our successes, but we also have to take a moment to reflect, to think about how can we do things better? What are our opportunities and challenges that are still out there? And so, you know, I'm gonna reflect back to 2009 uh, when uh, we were uh, contacted by uh, Senator Richard Luger's office um, who had been leading efforts in the Senate. And we worked together on it and uh, started drafting legislation, working with so many people, people from the Chicago Council, many of the organizations that are out here today from faith community and other NGOs. Um, and it was at a time when our country, even then, was sometimes divided on issues, but we could come together to address the critical needs of global food security. And it spoke to people across the spectrums. And one of the, the global food security is important enough on its own, but we were in the throes of the HIV AIDS conf uh, uh, conflict. Uh, you know, what are we gonna do about making sure that we reduce the spread and transmission of HIV AIDS? And, and Chris was a leader on, on that as well. But one of the things that impacted me was um, when in uh, Tanzania, there were two women who literally lived across the street from each other. One had access to food security and HIV drugs. The other woman who had a small child was trying to gain enough weight so that she would qualify to be able to take the HIV drugs. There was one success story and one story that haunts me. So uh, the, 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 the nexus of food and making so many of the other interventions that we're working on for global health and global security, they really come together. There's other programs that we're very involved in, uh, Governor McDole, uh, Food to Peace. Um, we don't have to look forward to see what a leader the United States has been on global food security. But as Americans, we come together to realize that when you have nearly 800 million people going to sleep every night, that's not a good thing. When you have 155 million children suffer, suffering from the, desert, uh, the, the effects of stunting, that's not a good thing. And that's not a good thing not only for that country, but for that child in particular. And you put them together, the country loses the work, the productivity, the creativity of that child because not only is their body stunted, but their mental development stunted as well. So we as Americans, we came together. We said we not only have a moral imperative to act, but if that's enough for you, we'll give you a national security reason to act. Because hungry people become desperate people. Food insecurity sets the stage for instability, violent extremism, and regions where it's already very vulnerable for those populations. So Feed the Future, as it took off under the Obama administration, worked to improve the lives of millions of people in these regions. It did so by increasing agriculture pro, uh, production, access to markets, business develop, nutrition intervention. And one of the things that excites me so much, and I'm sure many people in this room, is Feed the Future empowered women. Yes, women to address their livelihoods, to take it into their own hands, to become more self-sufficient. Because it is women, women who are Far, the small farm holders that really make a difference in, in nutrition, not only for their family, but for their communities. Feed the Future, with America's leadership, has helped with nine million people living above the poverty line now. 1.7 million more households are hunger free, and 1.8 million children, as was pointed out, 
are no longer suffering from stunting. But sadly, as, as uh, was kind of pointed out, sometimes we find ourselves with the current Trump administration kind of looking at ways to draw away from the global stage. And we don't want that to happen. We don't want America to be risking its leadership and all the, all the wonderful uh, things that we have done being valued partners with countries all around the world. We don't want to lose that. We want to make sure that we move forward with that. So the Trump administration, you know, they made a proposal, but as we like to say in the House, the administration, you know, proposes and we dispose of the money. And so uh, Chris and I had been doing a lot of work. And so uh, when the administration had looked at slashing funding for critical globe food security by nearly 50%, as a member of the Appropriation Committee, working with a member from the Authorization Committee, we together with our allies, we fought back against these proposed cuts. And I'm so glad that Congress was able to come together to ensure proper funding when we passed the FY18 omnibus bill. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that the FY uh, 2019 State and Foreign Operations Bill that was just released this morning funds the Global Food Security Act at the authorized level. So with a glowing global, global population, mounting conflicts, mass migration, the increasing uncertainty of how climate change is going to impact food production is more important than ever for America to continue to lead on global food security. So let's reauthor reauthorize the Global Food Security Act so we don't look back 10, 20, or even 50 years from now and realize we stood by. We did not do anything as a leading nation to address this global crisis. So together, we must, as Americans and as a Congress, we must reaffirm our long-held American commitments to helping those less fortunate than us, for fighting for human dignity, and building a more prosperous and stable world. When we do that, when we do that together, collectively, we fight global hunger, we fight poverty, we create an opportunity to make this world more peaceful, not only today, but for future generations. And who wouldn't want to do that? Not only for America's children, but for the children all around the world who count on us to give them an opportunity to grow and prosper and be future leaders in peaceful countries. With that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Congresswoman McCollum. I really like your point, too, about how this links in with global health and many of the other development initiatives that our, our government takes the leadership on. Our next speaker is Congressman Chris Smith, who's been representing New Jersey's fourth district for nearly four decades. I kept having to look at that to see if that was right. Um, he has authored literally a record number of laws during his time in office. He's a senior member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and chairman of its Africa Global Health um, Global Human Rights and International Organization Subcommittee. I can say I've participated and watched several of his hearings that he's done on these kinds of topics, and I can tell you that he is passionate about effective foreign assistance and understands why this is so important to both U.S. values as well as our national security. The podium is yours, Congressman Smith. Thank you very much, Kimberly, for that very kind introduction for your advocacy, which really does make a huge difference. Uh, if it wasn't for uh, individuals like yourself and NGOs that really keep all of us focused on this winnable war against hunger, uh, it would not be winnable. And we are making significant strides, and I want to thank you uh, and others in this room for the wonderful work you're doing. And certainly, uh, it's a great partnership with Betty McCollum. Uh, we work very closely, uh, ourselves and our staffs, uh, not only on the authorizing side, but also on the appropriation side to make sure uh, that we see no diminution when it comes to this commitment, which is bipartisan. It certainly uh, had its, its beginnings in the Bush administration. It took off under the Obama administration and now is continuing. You know, when you hear budgets coming up that zero out food for peace, for example, don't believe it. Uh, as Kimberly said, four decades, I've been in Congress now for 38 years, and I've never seen a budget that wasn't dead on arrival. 
Uh, not one, not even Reagan's. They were all dead on arrival. That we go, thank you very much. We look for the shredder. I say that with some respect. Uh, but then we start working in a bipartisan way to get it right. And um, we have experts, obviously, who testify, and they really make a huge difference. You know, Betty didn't leave much more to say about uh, the issue of the Global Food Security Act, but I just want to say how important and landmark it was. Uh, Dr. Shah, the former USAID administrator, was really a, a, a tiger, was pushing so hard that there's so much more that we can do to mitigate hunger, to reduce stunting, uh, which is a global phenomenon that can be completely eradicated if the will and resources are married up with the need. Uh, and and uh, I've been all over Africa, all over Central and South America and Asia, and everywhere I go, whenever I meet with the head of state, whenever I meet with the health minister and others, it's always about what are you doing on food security? If you want to lessen maternal mortality, if you want to have children who are stronger, have better ability, cognitive abilities, because they were not shortchanged when it came to, to food and, and supplementation. Uh, make sure you're part of this program, part of the UN programs like the Scaling Up program, and part of this effort, and take ownership of it, of it yourself to ensure that your children, your moms, your families are, are strong. You know, parenthetically, I work a lot on autism. I've written three laws on autism. One of the things, takeaways, when you learn something that can be applied somewhere else, if a woman has folic acid, and the NIH uh, studies coming out of the autism uh, law uh, have found that a woman has folic acid in the first month of her pregnancy, there is about a 40% decrease of people on the spectrum. 40%. That, that you know, folic acid is, is a lifesaver, not too much, not too little. 400 micrograms seems to be the, the magic number. But if women get that before they get pregnant and during the first month, it has this incredible uh, impact. So it goes with other supplementation and other important food uh, that makes for stronger moms and stronger children. One of the programs we push hard in the Global Food Security Act uh, is the first thousand days from conception to that second birthday, an all important window for mother and baby. Uh, we, we know that neonates who are less likely to die or to be impaired or to be premature uh, when there is sufficient funding uh, during that critical first thousand days. Everywhere I go, and I mean everywhere, every foreign leader I meet with, last week it was with uh, President Hernandez of Honduras, and he is part of the, he's a focused country and part of the effort. Uh, first thing I talk about is feed the future, first thousand days. I was in Guatemala on the very day when they signed up for the first thousand days. I was with President Museveni in Uganda and said, you know, Mr. President, you're part of this, but frankly, there's a lot more you can do uh, to bring the blessings of this first thousand days initiative. And of course, it doesn't stop after the first thousand days, but that is a critical component for healthier children and children who will have a greater cognitive ability because they weren't denied basic supplementation. In Nigeria, uh, I've been there many times. I've been in places like Jos, which are where firebombing by Boko Haram, sadly, is commonplace. Uh, and they are suffering uh, an epidemic of, of food insecurity, particularly in the north. A lot of it is attributable to war and Boko Haram. But I can tell you, every time I meet with Bahari and already others uh, in the government, and we talk to the faith community, food security, you gotta make, I mean, you can grow anything in Nigeria, uh, but you gotta make sure it gets to the people so that they can be healthier uh, and, and have a longer and a better life. Uh, Beth Dumford, by the way, is doing a marvelous job. Uh, you know, she brings an expertise. She's testified several times. We all listen carefully, and I hope you will too, when she speaks. Uh, and she is, as she said, leaving to go to Niger uh, very soon, real soon. Uh, the more countries that become priority countries, uh, the better, because it means those kids, those families will be safer and stronger. Finally, I've introduced legislation for years. It has stalled, unfortunately. It's passed the Foreign Affairs Committee. Maybe we'll get it out on the floor. But neglected tropical diseases is also another important issue, as you know. Uh, about a billion people carry worms, obviously mostly in the developing world. And we don't want to feed the worms. We want to feed the future. We want to feed human beings. Uh, there's so much, you know, low cost interventions can, can eradicate the worms, but they come back. 
Uh, so our bill would take it to the next level with centers of excellence and a major effort to say we've got to eradicate those neglected tropical diseases and we certainly can do it. Deworming, about 80% of the uh, neglected tropical diseases are worms, 80%. All these little kids victimized, bulloted bellies all over the world uh, by worms. I remember at one of our hearings, we had a, a, a Baylor leader, a, a medical doctor who's probably the leader, Dr. Hotez, and he showed, gave us a slideshow and showed the pictures of what the worms look like inside little kids. Uh, you could, people were gasping in the audience, it was so gross, and yet they have to live with it. And yet if we provide more resources and a greater focus on that and integrate it with the Feed the Future efforts and all our other healthcare uh, interventions, it will make a difference. And finally, and, and, and Betty was wise to bring it up, the you know, whole idea that the PEPFAR program, which is now about $5 billion a year, uh, it was one of George W. Bush's greatest accomplishments and legacies. It was controversial at first, but he said, we're gonna do it. I remember Henry Hyde saying at one of our foreign affairs meetings, as he was chairman, he goes, he goes this is the equivalent of the Black Death. There are people dying from this horrific HIV AIDS pandemic, and we've got to stop it. Well, if you're not healthy, you can't take your ARVs healthy in the sense of food. If you don't have a stomach, if you've got a, a stomach that's empty, you can't take the medicines required uh, to lessen the damage uh, that is being done. And, and to, so it's, it's all interrelated. Uh, and again, Betty, it's a pleasure to work with you and an honor to work with you. And thank you, Kimberly, for inviting. Look forward to the questions. Mike for Congresswoman McCollum. I heard you were passionate about deworming. I didn't know you were that passionate. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Worms belong on hooks. <laughs> and fishing. So we, we, we only have about 15 minutes before they have to head on to their next events, but I wanted to be able to create some space for us to ask some questions. And I'd like to start um, by asking, I'll start with you, um, Congresswoman McCollum. You know, I think one of the reasons <clears throat> that that in Congress we've seen such bipartisan support, and you mentioned this as well, is the connections between food insecurity and political instability, something we talk about a lot here through our work as well. And so I'm curious if that's what you think is sort of the sticking point that brings in both sides of the political aisle. And I'm also curious um, if you feel like we have the right evidence to show that linkage. Well, I, I, I'm assuming this is on the, I need to do anything. Is it working? Could use my substitute teacher voice. <laughs> <laughs> but then our online audience wouldn't hear. Let's have TJ check it really fast. There we go. Yeah, there Let, we go. Let's hear it for the technicians. Yeah. <laughs> Behind the scenes, all of you. So I'm on the Defense Committee mm -hmm. and, uh, for Appropriations, and the Defense Department of Defense actually puts out a report where it talks about some of the national security issues. And uh, food insecurity uh, because of um, you know, severe drought, uh, climate change, and, that is, and, and hungry people and hungry kids. I mean, a parent does not want to see their child be hungry, and they'll do amazing things to uh, make make that happen. Um, so sometimes that's a conflict. Sometimes, and we're seeing this, and our, our European uh, brothers and sisters are having arrived to their shores, these boatloads of families that are leaving for food insecurity. Um, so we, we need to address that. Um, usually I think a lot of our colleagues, Chris, would, you know, on, on, on the first hello about we need to do something about starving children, they're there. We need to make sure mothers that are, are, are pregnant or planning on being pregnant, that they have proper nutrition. But some of our colleagues also need the national security uh, um, a point to it. So uh, hats off for the Department of Defense really looking at population growth, climate change, food insecurity, and water. Um, all going hand in hand. And so if we can address the food security um, part of that, we can go a long ways into um, making um, uh, tempers less flaring in, in many of these conflict countries. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Okay. <clears throat> I think they're, as uh, Betty indicated, very closely related. 
Um, I was, um, within the last year and a half, twice to South Sudan. Uh, all of us had great hopes and expectations for Salva Kiir and that new government when South Sudan became uh, the newest nation on earth. Uh, those hopes have been dashed. Uh, Salva Kiir, regrettably, and his troops uh, have raided World Food Program stocks, uh, have raped and attacked. Um, you know, it's become a, a tribal uh, uh, conflict, uh, the Nur and the Denka. And, and it's like, you know, stop it. And what is the outcome besides uh, workers, uh, humanitarian workers and all who are, are hurt? Uh, more food insecure people who are, can't plant, they can't grow, and certainly they can grow anything in South Sudan. It's, it's, it's like a breadbasket. Uh, so we've seen where there's dictatorship and corruption. Uh, it often leads to war, civil war, or, or wars that cross over borders. Uh, look what happened in Egypt some years uh, ago uh, when, the, when uh, Morsi came into power, uh, propelled by the food insecurity issues there. Um, and uh, one of the worst of all was using food as a weapon when Mengistu in Ethiopia back in the 1980s, uh, literally, there was, a, there was a famine, no doubt about it, that was exacerbated, uh, grossly exacerbated uh, by his dictatorship. Uh, and, and one of the grossest things of all, one of the worst things of all, as food aid was coming in, he was fleecing the donors and saying, you know, for every ton that comes in, I need this much money, and he caused it. Uh, so uh, I, I do think it leads to instability when people are hungry and they're restless as they should be. But usually the, what causes that in the first place is corrupt uh, management and dictatorship. Right now, the president is meeting with Kim Jong-un. We're all hoping and praying that that has a good positive outcome, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. But that said, we know for a fact that in this country, under various presidents, have tried to provide food security aid. Uh, much of it was fleeced by the military, as we all know. But look at the stunting problem. I remember at one of the, one of the Olympics, Again, talking about how when you have bad leadership, you get very bad outcomes. I remember the two soccer teams being next to each other and, and the, the demonstrable difference between South Koreans who happen to be from North Korea or South Korea, uh, Koreans. Uh, on the, and these are athletes, so they're in good shape, but food insecurity earlier in life led to stunting. Uh, so uh, there are many, many other examples, but where there's war and conflict, uh, the weakest, the most vulnerable are usually those hurt the most, and food insecurity is one of the predictables. Mm. Now your point, uh, bad leadership equals bad outcomes, I think we've seen that a lot of the, in the global food security trends we've been following. So one is that, and I'm sure you've heard this and most of our audience members know it, that after a decade of progress, we're seeing a rise in the number of hungry people in the world. It's now up to 815 million. Also, of course, there were four potential famines last year, and I would say all of those are still on the watch list, and there's some others that are very close to that. So going back to conflict, I want to keep going on that, um, Congressman Smith, because a lot of people would say the reason we're seeing those reversal in trends or, or troubling you know, um, trends is, goes back to conflict. So w any thoughts on what we need to be doing better in terms of averting those political crises in the beginning and how that can relate to development work? Uh, it's a great question, no easy answer. Certainly with Syria, there were a lot of signs, uh, harbinger of what was about to come. Uh, it was missed by many, but when you got a guy like Assad uh, that does what he does, um, and then you got ISIS that sprung up and all these, these terrible bloodletting killing machines, um, and ISIS certainly is now being largely vanquished, it's not gone yet, and I do attribute that to a very robust effort by U.S. military and coalition forces. Um, look at Yemen, that's also another uh, uh, disaster area for food and famine, uh, all because of the fighting. Um, I'm one of those who believes that we need a greater emphasis on holding the bad actors to account. I tried for four years, five years counting right now, to get a hybrid court uh, like we had in Sierra Leone, Yugoslavia, and Rwanda. The ICC is a good idea, in my opinion, but it only has two convictions in 14, 15 years, both of those from Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, a hybrid court like David Crane, remember him, uh, uh, the chief prosecutor, an American, uh, he's the one who brought Charles Taylor to justice and gave him a 50-year prison sentence at The Hague for his crimes against humanity. If there's a predictability with regards to, to um, consequences, I think it's higher possibility. I've met with Bashir, uh, the president of Sudan, uh, what does he want? He wants his indictment, and that one is by the ICC, lifted. Uh, he travels some places, 
you know, like China, and they say, come on, we're not going to do anything to, to send you to The Hague for... If he goes to other places in Europe, certainly if he ever came here, uh, we would want him immediately sent for uh, prosecution. I have a bill, H.R. 390, that the Senate has been holding up for a year. It would help the Christians and the Yazidis in, um, uh, and with food security and everything else they need, humanitarian assistance, um, in, um, in Erbil and around Mosul, Nineveh Plain. Uh, the second part of that bill is about accountability, making sure that we preserve the best documentation to bring uh, serious and predictable prosecutions against those on any side who commit war crimes and crimes against humanity. Without that, once you get into court, even Milosevic, when he was in the Yugoslav court, they had a, had a very good case to bring, or you lose. They walk free. Of the Vukovar three, uh, which was a terrible, terrible atrocity. I was in Vukovar during the Croatian war, uh, the uh, Yugoslav war. Uh, one of them got off scot-free. <laughs> you know, what's that all about? You know, they, they went into a hospital and summarily executed people, and that's only the sum of it. So we need to preserve that, and I think predictability with justice. Uh, you're going to prison, you do this. We're not kidding. The Nuremberg and Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal uh, was the launch of that. Uh, could have a chilling effect because if people know, you know, they, they can run but they can't hide, just like the Nazis who could run but couldn't hide, they're always being hunted down um, uh, for their crimes, it, it makes a difference. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that? Well, I just think it goes, goes to show, you know, there, there has to be swift and just uh, accountability from the international community. Yeah. But when you have a country that's trying to stand up, when you have a country that's trying to do the right things for the United States and for the European Union um, uh, to come in and say, you're, you're doing the right thing, we're gonna come in. We're gonna help you be more successful, not just a hand out, but a hand up out of poverty, a hand up to feed um, your, uh, your, your children, your future generation, a hand up with, with health care intervention so that you can become successful on your own. And when, there, when, you know, when, when you see beautiful flowers growing in your garden, everybody wants them, right? But when people see weeds in your garden, they say, no, 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 that's not what I want. And so we have to both pull out the weeds, but we have to nurture the flowers. And so that's what I'm so excited about, what programs like Feed the Future um, really starts, starts to do, to give hope, opportunity for those countries that are facing the challenges head on to do the right thing for their next generation and for their generation today. We're short on time, but I at least <coughs> want to open to the audience to take one or two quick questions. Uh, raise your hand if you have a question for either of our members of Congress. Let's go ahead and go right here. Mm -hmm. Anyone else on this side? Because we need to move quickly. Okay, go ahead. Make it short. My name is Nadim Khoury, um, independent researcher with the World Bank and IFPRI. Um, my question is uh, concerning the Global Food Security Act that <coughs> uh, does it automatically mean now that it's, uh, uh, I guess, uh, reapproved that the strategy that was under the uh, act is also um, still relevant or is it going to require a new strategy? If you recall, the original uh, Food Security Act required a strategy that then was approved. Do we have the same process or is it the same strategy? Great. Let's do, let's do one more question from the audience, and then we'll turn to you both. Bob, Hi. Uh, Bob Rubatsky with FinTrack. Um, you both commented on how the budgets are going through, and you're, you're fully appropriating, but we're hearing things from OMB Mulvaney about rescission, and the flow of funds may not necessarily be getting to where they need to go in the agency. Um, comments? Great. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, ta <coughs> I'll take the, the, the rescission and, and that um, first. So first and foremost, Congress appropriates funds. And what I think you're going to see Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, do a lot more is stand up and demand accountability and transparency on how, on how funding is being released. I'm just starting to dig in deep with what is going on with some of our international funding. But let me give you one crisis funding amount that I think you'll find shocking. I'm the ranking member on the Interior Appropriations Committee, which uh, had funding that went into both the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico uh, after hurricane relief. Congress, we came together. Crystal will tell you, it was tough getting the hurricane relief funding. We came together 
$516 million in February. We thought that money was going to get out the door. I mean, we knew what needed to uh, start happening with the electric grid, what we needed to do with roads, sewer, water, hospitals, great needs. That was a drop in the bucket, and some of that, some of that funding comes, uh, comes within the purview of the Interior Committee. When I told the committee at our, last, at, at our, at our full committee markup in appropriations that only $3 million had been appropriated since February, that's half of 1%. Rescissions are sometimes used that the money hasn't been spent. Folks, I can guarantee you both sides of the aisle when it comes to hurricane relief, other things happening here in the United States, whether it's research and science in institutions that are seeing the money being, being held up, we are going to keep our eye. I can't think of a better watchdog, you just heard him, than having Chris, Chris Smith, uh, as, an, uh, as an authorizer out there helping me as an appropriator to make sure all this money gets delivered in a timely, effective fashion. When Congress votes and tells the administration that's how the money's going to move forward, we're going to make sure that it happens. And I'll let you take the other question, Chris. Good, good answer. Um, I would just say that we learned in my own state of New Jersey when Hurricane Sandy hit, uh, there was a reluctance to appropriate sufficient funds. We pushed very hard for it. Uh, for New York, New Jersey, and other affected communities, we ended up getting $60 billion. Uh, and that money was very well utilized. Um, uh, people got back on their feet. Um, the, the businesses, schools, the like, it, it, was, it was an amazing effort. Uh, but there were delays. There were delays. And it, it was very difficult to tell someone who has been out for two years and is still waiting for the help, uh, you know, the check is in the mail. So we always need to be learning from that. And when Harvey and the, and, and the other crises hit, and matter of fact, uh, Mark Green, who was a great USAID administrator, uh, one of the best of the best, our former ambassador to Tanzania, uh, he, just, he just knows it, lives it, believes it, is passionate. While all of us were focusing on the Americans that were hurt in Puerto Rico and elsewhere, he was traveling in the Caribbean doing an assessment on uh, the Caribbean nations that were devastated by the hurricanes and coming up with a, a package for them to assist them. Uh, we had, Americans are extraordinarily generous. So you just want to make sure their money is being used wisely. Uh, and we do have all kinds of oversight and accountability. That's part of what we do. IG certainly keep a check on those things as well. GAO, General Accountability Office, in like manner. Uh, so I'm happy, you know, when we authorize something and appropriate it, it needs to get where, to where it was intended or have a very good excuse. And there's not much, we usually underestimate what the real need is, uh, at least that's been my experience. And in terms of the bill, uh, the Global Food Security Act, uh, which uh, Betty and I are co-sponsoring. Uh, that legislation builds on what is already there, uh, the strategy, it looks to expand it. I mentioned the warming as, as one of the elements we put into it. Uh, some of those that were left out, like the Inter-American uh, Foundation, is now included. That was left out inadvertently last time. Uh, and we're always looking to say, what have we missed? That's why I like authorizations. How do we set up parameters for a program? Then work hand in glove with the appropriators to make sure that the money is there year in and year out. And uh, so um, it, it's a very dynamic process. One of the three jobs of congressman, right, uh, congresswoman, write laws, do casework, and oversight. The oversight part uh, is less glamorous, but I have to tell you, it is one of the most important aspects of this job. And any White House, any OMB needs to be watched, I don't care what party, to make sure that that money is getting to where it's supposed to go. And, and just, just, just to piggyback on what um, Chris said, we have the measurable outcomes um, from you know, ambassadors and, and, and the work that uh, USAID's doing. We know it's working. We are not afraid to put our, our statistical evidence uh, against uh, you know, a bright light for anybody to look at. It works. And that's why other countries want to sign up. That's why we have countries that you'll hear about from USA that are, that are, are nearing graduation. And one of the things, I work with a lot of World Bank parliamentarians that Chris does in his work when he travels and when I travel, is we ask those ministers and we ask the, the, the heads of state, what are you doing how are you adding? What are you bringing value? What can I tell your people that your government is doing to make this a success? Because if it's not a partnership, 
we're not going to see success. And um, Feed the Future is built on the whole premise that it is hand in hand, it is a solid partnership, and we are working towards that day where you celebrate your graduation on um, that, that you have achieved success, and then we can move on together using their, their, their example, using some of their expertise and their fellow citizens to come with us to the next country to say, see, together we can do this, together we can have success, and we can feed the future, which leads towards world peace. Can I just add, Kamala, real quick? Sure. And I hope Beth Dumford really elaborates on this, but USAID and Dr. Shaw and the last administration, uh, Administrator Smith, and, and now certainly uh, uh, Mark Green, uh, they and their staffs are dogged about making sure you chronicle, you know, we don't want any dollar being wasted because that means something that doesn't help somebody in need. Uh, and they are doing a magnificent job of chronicling and saying, where's the need? Where's the unmet need? How do we get the money from here to there? So I want to compliment them for being such great stewards of, uh, of, of the purse. And add to that, um, you know, the Agenda 2030, the UN SDGs, uh, give us another framework uh, to try to promote humanitarian interventions all over the world and get to a sustainable uh, situation on, in every level, environmental as well as uh, with regards to food and, 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 and health. Thank you both Thank so you. much. Um, Thank you. Of course. Let's give a round of applause for them. I know you both have events to do, so you can go ahead and ask Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you so for much. Sure. The next panel represents almost a public see, see the those. future reunion of sorts. Um, during their time at USAID, each of our speakers helped create and shape the Feed the Future initiative since its inception in 2010. They've also played an important role in advising our work here at CSIS. Ambassador Bill Garvelink and Julie Howard both have formal affiliations with the CSIS Global Food Security Project. Jada McKenna was part of, of an advisory council that I started as I was getting our program started. And Beth Dubbert, a former colleague, a friend, and a great enthusiastic leader of Feed the Future today. Um, I've asked Ambassador Garling to moderate, um, but before they come, I just want to say one quick thing. Don't forget that we have a reception after this. It'll be uh, just across the hall on the same floor. Um, we consider this as a dialogue, but we don't want it to end here. The point is to keep these conversations going. So I hope you can stay, talk with our panelists, talk with our team, talk with each other, um, and different opinions are welcome. It's easier to digest that when you have food and drink in hand. So over to you, Bill. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. I didn't realize there were that many people here. That's good. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have have this group here. I don't think there's ever been so many uh, deputy coordinators for development <laughs> in a room at one time. So, so it's a it's a pleasure to have everyone here. Um, Kimberly did talk a little bit about everyone, and I believe in the handouts you have their their biographies. So I'm not going to re repeat that. This is Dr. Julie Howard, J Jada McKenna, and Dr. Beth Dunford. We're all former, she's current, as the <laughs> deputy coordinator for development. So um, I think we want, would like to use this time to talk about the history of Feed the Future and look a little bit toward the future and if there's any modifications or changes that might be useful uh, to make. And I guess, um, the question I would like to ask each of you in, in, as we go down is to uh, reflect on the successes and the challenges that your time involved with Feed the Future. And I guess I was the first deputy coordinator, so I'll start with just a couple of comments. And it, it was interesting reflecting on the, I, I came back from the Congo in 2010 with the understanding that we were going to set up a, a relatively small office uh, to coordinate Feed the Future. And once I got to AID, they said, well, but you've you got to control the budget and the program, too. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> that's, that's not a small little office. So the first task I was very much focused on was creating a Bureau of Food Security. Um, 
it was a bit of a challenge. I was not a popular guy in AID because we didn't get any new positions. We had to take them from other parts of AID to set up the Bureau for Food Security. But, but uh, with everybody's goodwill, we, we pulled that off. And we worked very hard in this, those early days to work with Congress to build their support, which was a really easy thing to do given the past couple of years, the focus on these issues. It got a little harder when we started talking about a bureau. Um, then uh, I don't think was in the earlier discussions about Feed the Future, there wasn't a real discussion of a 100-person bureau that would have to be put together to, to, to manage the initiative. But that worked, and the other things we worked on in those very early days, Jada was there, was building a, a whole of government uh, and working with the various other government agencies and building interest in Feed the Future. Uh, particularly with the State Department, which, which uh, we were talking about that a little bit earlier. One of the, the first deputy coordinator for uh, diplomacy, most people don't remember, it was Ambassador um, Christy Kenny, who was there for about six weeks between her assignment as ambassador to, to uh, the Philippines to ambassador to Thailand. So it was a, it was a kind of a complicated setup to, to build relationships because we were in, a, in quite a state of flux. Just one, <coughs> a couple of final comments. I think two decisions made in those very early days have proved to be very useful ones. And one is to include nutrition uh, as part of the Feed the Future <coughs> initiative. And the second was not to include uh, the Office of Food for Peace at, at the present time. There were a lot of things going on in that office was, that had a very important function on emergency food aid in particular, and we didn't really want to disrupt that uh, as we were creating a bureau and, and new procedures for, for dealing with, with Feed the Future. Um, there was a lot of bipartisan support for this, and my colleagues will talk about that. It was a little bit of a harder sell to the senior people in AID itself. Um, when Feed the Future was announced, the reaction of country mission directors, uh, senior people in bureaus was, oh, another initiative. Um, and is it going to be real? Is it going to be funded? Is it going to survive? And I think it took a little while of work, particularly with mission directors and, and sitting ambassadors, to, to build their confidence. And over time, they began to see that this was not your normal new initiative. And it, it, it built based on commitment, based on funding, and based on persistence. And I think it's, it's become an integral part of what USAID is now. And so with that, I will turn it over to Julie to talk about challenges, successes, while you were deputy coordinator. Great. OK. With your permission, I'd like to back up a little bit and talk about what's, what's in the DNA of Feed the Future. So the, the time that, that Representative McCollum was talking about, 2008, when she got a call from Senator Luger, well, what was that call all about? It was about a response. What will the U.S. response be to this global mm -hmm. food price crisis that we were undergoing? Um, really, before that time, agriculture development had sort of fallen off the radar. You know, we played a big role in the Green Revolution in the 1970s, 1980s. The U.S. was a leader with Rockefeller Foundation and Ford Foundation in putting together an agricultural research superstructure uh, and technology adoption dissemination mechanisms. But then we got complacent. So when we had this, this big set of shocks in 2007, 2008, with price increases of well over 100% for the major staples, we saw political riots on all three continents. On three continents, we, had, we saw governments fall. And Senator Luger and Senator Casey asked themselves in this bipartisan way, what are we going to do? You know, we'd sort of gotten into the habit in the US of, of, of food aid. OK, it must be about food aid. And so the spending on food aid, important as it is, has started to really dwarf agricultural assistance. Senators Luger and Casey asked CSIS at that time uh, to put together a task force and on a very short time schedule, and within months, really three months, put together a set of discussions. Uh, and those were a really exciting set of discussions with US university representatives, with private sector, with Department of Defense, with USAID, Current, and, and X. Uh, with, with a whole broad range of folks. What should the U.S. response, what would it be a more strategic response look like? And I just happened to look at that report that came out three months after the, the discussion started. 
and saw that that report really previewed a, a lot mm -hmm. of stuff that came out finally in Feed the Future. And I looked at it and I said, called for the U.S. to commit $1 billion annually of bilateral assistance. Called for better coordination and integration of U.S. assistance programs. Sound familiar? Uh, Jada and, and Beth. Set a, an official target to significantly increase productivity and reduce, reduce malnutrition. Um, all of these things. Set up a bureau, a, a new bureau in the USAID. So I think folks don't, don't remember that, perhaps. Mm -hmm. and, and it was the product of a, a lot of groups coming together. And it was the product of you know, what had been sort of a, uh, I would say, contentious, sometimes contentious relationship between groups like the one I used to lead, focused on agricultural development with, with Daniel Karunja, uh, started by Peter McPherson, and the humanitarian assistance groups. And really, this was a time when these issues became elevated to a national security concern that the community came together and said, you know, we need both. Yeah, let's find a way forward together. So I just wanted to, to close mm -hmm. with a couple of comments. One is that that national security concern you know, was absolutely critical. We would not have Feed the Future if it hadn't been for the vision in Congress, uh, for the vision and support of the community. And I would say, I mean, Feed the Future all along has been a conversation yeah, with the community, uh, with Congress. The community has been there all along since 2008. Uh, without the community, without the U.S. University community, without NGOs, without leadership, we wouldn't have Feed the Future, we wouldn't have GFSA, and we wouldn't have the focus on nutrition, mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't have the focus on indicators. It's been very, very interesting. Great, thank you. Thank Jada. you, Th and thank you to CSIS for, for hosting us and allowing us to collectively reflect and a little collective therapy as well. So um, I, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, I had the privilege of working on this for five years. And, and I think there are three things that really um, stood out to me um, and what we were doing and how it was different and things that I think have had a lasting impact on the initiative. Um, I think the first, um, when I arrived, one of the first things that was underway um, and that really became a major push for us was developing the monitoring and evaluation framework. And um, I remember Kristen Penn from MCC, I mean, that was the first of trying to get like the best in class from what we knew across the U.S. government invested in this energy. And, and MCC at that time had been a huge leader in m, &M &E. And so um, Kristen Penn and then turned out to be a bigger team of people really developed that framework in a very consultative way, um, talked to everybody. It felt like years that it took. But, but now we have these concrete results and data that Beth is able to talk about and frame. And we were able to course correct. And there were some really pioneering things in that, like the women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index that I think helped people to just think about this differently and to feel confident that we were making a big investment, but that we would really understand what was coming out of it. So um, I'm really grateful for that. Um, the other pillar of Feed the Future, and, and Julie alluded to it, was that just deep partnership was built into the DNA. Um, and you know, I came to this initiative from a foundation. I was at the Gates Foundation. So as a funder, you talk to whoever you want, and you give money to whoever you want, and you don't have to talk to a lot of people <laughs> and, and, and if you don't want to. And in Feed the Future, we had to talk to you everybody all the time. So uh, within the US government, there were a lot of meetings. Um, and sometimes I thought I'd lose my mind. But it, we really got to an amazing place with that. We really, um, I think each of our agencies really dug deep and said, what can we bring to this? What are we good at? We challenged each other. And, and I think the results, um, I'm proud to say I still talk to all my former state colleagues. I'm still in touch with everybody. Um, USDA, like we, we were just in the trenches, MCC, obviously, um, OPIC, and, and, and we, we stayed there together, and we really worked at it. And, and we, were, we were blessed in that we had um, people like Gail Smith making sure that we did it and holding us accountable, but, but I think it led to something really richer overall. The other aspect of partnership that was probably even more important than the USG partnership was just the deep partnerships that we did on the ground in the countries that we were working. So um, we had the country plan process. I think the very first CADAP country plan meeting in Rwanda 
Rwanda. I think Gail Smith went to that. I think mm -hmm. Susan Rice may have even mm -hmm. gone to, to Kigali to see the launch of that. And even within Feed the Future, we decided um, to go deeper. So within country plans, to really pick specific geographic areas where we could work with all the partners in country and have civil society consultation um, and, and a lot of things. Some people would ask, like, why are you working so much with CADAP or why are you working with this person? And at the end of the day, I think it became something that everyone collectively owned and wanted to work and then that helped with its success. Um, the final thing I want to point to, um, and, and I, had, I worked on this quite extensively, uh, was really the private sector mm -hmm. engagement aspect of Feed the Future. So um, we talk a lot about deal making these days, and I like to think Feed the Future was in the deal making business as well. Uh, at, at some point, uh, we had we set up an office for private sector engagement um, in the bureau when it first started. I think the private sector was something that uh, not everyone was universally welcoming of, um, and we really pushed forward to understand where there were mutual interests, where we could leverage our investments, and, and where we could help find better market opportunities for people. Um, and so things like the, the we used the then G8 to create the new alliance, I think now that's the wholly African-owned initiative that's integrated in the CADAP process. And I think those were ways that the US government tried to catalyze different partnerships, and, and I, I think it still lasted, so I'll end there. Uh, thanks. It's a it's an honor to be here today, um, Congress, uh, Congressman Smith, Congresswoman McCollum. They're not here anymore, but just really want to thank Congress for their sustained support for Feed the Future, which has really made this all possible. And it's really humbling to be here with all of the deputy coordinators. I've worked for every single one, um, so basically <laughs> they are my mentors. And um, it's really building on the success of everything that they've done that we are here where we are today. So when you talk about uh, Ambassador Garveling's question, what are your six biggest successes and challenges, the success are the results. And I'll just like rattle off a few that again build on all of these years of investment. We've seen a 20% reduction in poverty, 27% uh, reduction in stunting. That's four times greater than areas not touched by Feed the Future. So we are really driving results that are impressive. Um, I could go on and on. Um, agricultural growth rates that are t three times greater than other countries not impacted by, e by Feed the Future. Um, I think that we have a lot of stats now because we did build this monitoring evaluation system. We're able to tell Congress this is what we are doing with the funds that you've appropriated, and I think that has really made all the difference. But we're, what really brings all of this together for me is, um, is really almost intangible. Um, you know, we've invested a lot in research, uh, really significantly increased our research investment that again is sustained over time. And we've seen 900 technologies that we've developed uh, and, and brought to fruition. Uh, one of them was an investment uh, along with a lot of other partners, both in the private sector, other foundations, governments on water efficient maize. Uh, in 2016, we were able to get water efficient maize out to farmers, six million in Southern Africa that were affected by an El Nino drought. So that's six million families uh, that had, uh, had a crop that year that others did not. Um, they were able to gain revenues of $126 million uh, and those who didn't have the water efficient maize didn't have that money. That's real money in the hands of real farmers. But even beyond sort of the technology, getting the technology out to farmers during a really important year of drought uh, was the fact that there were 100 seed companies in Southern Africa that were able to get this market out, this seed out through the market to these farmers. These 100 seed companies did not exist before Feed the Future came. Otherwise, how would we, not only do we have to invest in the research, uh, reach the smallholders, but we needed a private sector vehicle to do that, and these were these seed companies. Um, it also involved a lot of policy work to have um, the ability to trade that seed, um, to be able to um, market that seed through the private sector. All of these things require years and years and years of investment and start really getting that agricultural transformation that we need to achieve our goals in food security. So there are many successes, um, just giving you a flavor, but this is really built on, again, a sustained investment that I'm really proud to have been a part of. When we talk of challenges, uh, we look at the success that we're having, the development gains, the food security gains that we're having across the board, 
and really these gains are coming under increasing threat. We're seeing crises, um, climatic shocks, other kinds of shocks that are impacting and threatening um, the progress that we're making. So how are we accelerating this progress but at the same time protecting it in the face of these shocks that are becoming more frequent, more severe, more complex? And I think for us that's been the challenge of how do we uh, take uh, feed the future to that level. We've been investing in some of these areas and I think where we've uh, invested the longest probably is in northeastern Kenya where we do have results. I was just at the Old Dinero market last uh, September in northeastern Kenya, which used to be, I think, this pretty small market where 200 sheep, camels, goats would kind of pass through every other week. And it was an old dilapidated market with not a lot of infrastructure. Uh, and the first whiff of drought, the market would completely collapse. And the pastoralists in the area would have no outlet uh, and would be forced to rely on food aid for assistance and lose their livelihoods as their herds were decimated by the drought. Um, the government of Kenya first really stepped up and said, we want to do things differently. We want to invest in this area. USAID and other donors provided a lot of support. Uh, the government built a road to this market. We helped rehabilitate the market, um, put in some basic infrastructure, cell phone towers, um, support to small businesses. And now you see a thriving market where herders are up from Nairobi on their cell phones making trades. Uh, you've got uh, 3,000 camels, sheep, and goats coming through uh, every other week. And this, this market stayed strong through the last drought there. And I think that's the kind of resilience that we're looking for that we need to continue to invest in and push throughout the initiative to be able to protect the progress that we're making on this journey to self-reliance. If I could just ask, continue with, with what you were talking about there, Beth, and, and ask you a follow-on question. USAID is going through a reorganization now. And they're, they're making a lot of changes. What is that? Uh, have to say about the future of Feed the Future uh, in the reorganized USAID? So I th one of the, the goals has been to elevate resilience and food security uh, within USAID's organization and uh, uh, ensure our ability to be effective in this area. And the fact that this was one of the stated goals and objective I think shows that food security is front and center of the Administrator Green's overarching goal, which is the, again, uh, to accelerate the journey to self-reliance that we're seeking um, in this area. And so I think they'll, um, we're looking at, um, at proposed um, changes where we will uh, look at uh, uh, greater collaboration with humanitarian assistance and with our conflict programming to be able to work on the food security and resilience side. Great. Um, if it's okay with you, I think we, we do have a relatively short period of time here. So maybe we'll open it to, to questions. Mm -hmm. So we'll take a couple of questions up there. And this, we'll take one or two. And up in the front here. Thank you all very much for what you're doing. All four of you have been working at this for a long time. And you're making an awful lot of progress um, across a lot of fronts, seeds for sure all the seed companies that you're talking about. I get this sense, this is my own personal feeling, that the missing link is still getting those seeds to the farmers. It's, it's the private sector um, agro-dealer network that is just not there the way it needs to be. Can we do something as we reauthorize the Global Food Security Act to uh, put a shot in the arm for the agro-dealer network and stimulate uh, the distribution system. Uh, you're making so much progress in seeds and fertilizers, public policy, market building. But if those seeds don't get to that smallholder farmer, uh, w w we're not going to be self-reliant. How do we improve that? So I, I think, I mean, you're, I'm oh, sorry, should I? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think you're on the mark. Seeds are really important in the distribution network through the private sector actors is the critical link. I think it's something that we're making a lot of progress on. I think the language in the, food, in the Global Food Security Act gives us room to do that, and I think we need to continue to up and increase our investment on the policy side, which is incredibly important, and then also with the private sector, and we're, we are upping our investment in that. So I think we've got what we need. We just need to continue it and, and, and support it more going forward. 
Julie. Thank you, yeah, Marshall, thanks for that question. I think it's a, it's a great question. And, and, and Beth, thanks also for talking about the dramatic increase we've had in agricultural research, tripled you know, between 2008 and 2014. That's great. Also revitalized the relationship with the US universities yep. and CG system. It's been great, 24 Feed the Future Innovation Labs. But I think you're absolutely right. The technologies aren't getting out yep. fast enough to the farmers. And that's not just something faced by, by USAID, but by every single donor. Now, I, I'm pleased that, that USAID has taken steps towards thinking about what does it take to, to get technology adoption, now, not just in a project area, but in a scaled, for scaled impact beyond our project partners. Private sector companies are part of the answer, policies are part of the answer, but also you know, really facilitating collaborations with, with other donors yeah. and NGOs and everybody in this space and putting the proper management incentives in place so that you don't get a message if you're an implementer that, okay, plant the flag and have an impact just in your square area, but be looking for opportunities to collaborate with others that can take the technology farther. Now, I, I think one of the things I'm really proud of is not only has, has the U.S. sort of reclaimed its position that it had in the 70s and 80s of being a global leader on global food security issue, but we're also an emerging leader now in thinking about these scaling issues. Incredibly important. Health has done more on that, but agriculture, not so much. So, but there's, there's promising signs. I see a big emphasis on that in the new strategy. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. To what extent are you able to use the internet to coordinate things, to hold meetings and get the private sector and local groups together and get an economic consensus for the program? I, I think, uh, I think smart, the, um, the more and more people have access to smartphone technology I think is really revolutionizing how we engage and what we're able to accomplish. We're seeing, you know, smallholder farmers in rural areas who have cell phones, who can track the data of their field, their soil type, um, use that to get uh, connected to dealers with the right inputs. I'm talking smallholders with, you know, one hectare, two hectares, uh, very rural areas, off paved roads, have this technology, not everybody, but it's growing, and it can really get them the right inputs when they need them. Uh, it's also helping farmers track their yield data year after year after year, which they're then taking to banks to use as collateral for loans, which I think is something that has always been an issue about how we get credit to these actors. Uh, so again, it's starting to really revolutionize things and will only grow as cell phone access does increase. One, I, I, I think that there's a lot of promise uh, for all kinds of ICT yeah, use, but infrastructure say. and access <laughs> to broadband is a massive constraint. In, in my post-USAID life, I've been working on a project in Nigeria where we thought, great, you know, we can do a lot on ICT. And of course, it's Nigeria, everybody's going to have access. Not the case at all, right? And especially women don't have access. So if we don't work on the infrastructure issues, mm. if we don't work on the broadband access issues, uh, we're, we're not going to get, we're not going to see the gains that we see are possible. And we're possibly also going to um, uh, prejudice interventions against young women who mm -hmm. tend to have less access than young men to these. Mm -hmm. Farmers are also not um, the most trusting group. <laughs> they won't just accept mm. what, what you tell them right away. And so mm. I think that it does highlight the importance, too, of continuing to foster like local agricultural networks, extension agents, and, and other people who then can use the ICT and uh, propagate them. But there have to be trusted on the ground actors that have face-to-face -face interaction with smallholders to make sure that it, it gets to the end user that we care the most about. Other, other questions over here and over there? We'll take them both. Thank you. My name is Phil Thomas. I'm with George Mason University. And I guess my question is, uh, where is the new alliance on food security and nutrition that was established by the Obama administration in uh, May 2012? dedicated money to private-public partnerships under the umbrella of Feed the Future. Now, Feed the Future, you know, we hear a lot about private-public partnerships, but has there been uh, an analysis done by aid about a successful framework? And is that framework available to help others develop successful private-public partnerships? Uh, 
get this question here. Hi, thank you, and, and thanks uh, everyone uh, on the panel for the great work you've done in building the foundation and growing Food uh, Feed the Future. My name is Kent Ford, I'm with Creative Associates International, and I just wanted to know what the future, um, or how, how you see the future of engaging the private sector, continually leveraging you know, private sector resources, private sector investment, you know, the catalytic, uh, uh, you know, the catalytic ca capacity of the private sector in this work. It was noted earlier that the private sector has not, uh, or, or, or some people had a hesitance in bringing the private sector in to feed the future, but now I think in, as we look at going forward, it seems that there's a great place that, for the private sector, I'm just wanting to know how the panelists, especially Beth, might see uh, engaging uh, the private sector in the future. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll go, start. And I'll do going with the first one, the new alliance? Yeah, and I think it connects related, to the second yeah. question. They're, They're interrelated. Related. Okay. Do, did you want to get more? Well, yes. No, go ahead. Okay. So um, the new alliance, and, and I'll let Beth talk to where these organizations are today, uh, but the new alliance um, was focused on a, it wasn't, it was focused on kind of compacts that everyone could see about what the private sector would do, what the public, what the government was committing to, what other actors were committed to, and there was an intense letter of intent process that went along with that, um, where companies were kind of mentioned specific things and, and people talked about it. That has become an African-owned initiative. The first offshoot of that was Grow Africa um, that worked with CADAP and other actors to kind of formalize that and take it to more countries and track things. Um, that has become a more, a wholly owned African agenda and I think they've evolved from the letters of intent to making sure that there are facilitative environments but Beth knows a little bit more about where that sits today so so I will let that go I think one of the great things about the private sector engagement is that it hits all areas of it so um, the innovation labs work with private sector actors that are developing things that are that are great in that specific area um, there are concrete partnerships to get technologies or, or products to, to farmers on the ground um, but I think it in the, the, what we learn and, and what they learn from working with us on projects as well kind of it's a nice cycle that reinforces each other. I, I guess, um, I mean, Jada was really the sort of brains and the lead behind our private sector work that we're still um, looking to push out into the field. And I think that just the success of what Jada put in place uh, has been very, has been tremendous. The new alliance has become uh, Africanized, is now led by um, the African Union through, uh, as they develop their national agricultural investment plans, there is um, an annex to it, which is the Comprehensive Agribusiness Platform, the CAPF. And so this really uh, is the governments putting out their own plan for their engagement with the private sector. Uh, this may sound a little bit bureaucratic and wonky, but to have African governments standing up in large meetings saying, we need the private sector at the table, I think was fairly unheard of when we started this. Yeah. The dialogue, uh, the thinking about private sector has completely transformed, largely, I think, due to the U.S.'s leadership. Uh, so again, the new alliance has become, um, has become owned by the countries themselves, which I think is the most exciting um, indicator of success. And going forward, I think, you know, there are many things, the future is with the private sector, get the policy environment right, and then uh, work with the private sector to help them create win-win <coughs> solutions. One of the most important things is to get finance to really de-risk some of these investments, especially for the smaller and medium enterprises that need to get in there to make this all work. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of attention going to finance to farmers, which I think is important. I'm not saying there's enough, but how these small and medium enterprises that we really need to get the whole agri-food system, that value chain working, those small actors, these small seed companies, processors, distributors, transporters, to get them to scale up, to move what we need to move in the system, it's those um, small and medium enterprise loans that I think are also really hard um, to get out to people, and that's what we need to be, that's one of the areas of many, many that we need to be working on going forward. And I'm sure Jada has a million ideas too. It's really, and, really interesting <laughs> to think about the, the, the initial perception of the new alliance, I think, almost in the U.S. and globally, was, oh, this is about U.S. US companies going out and doing land grabs and taking over GMO. Yes, yeah, <laughs> all that. Uh, and, you know, of course, we, we did try uh, to, to facilitate some of those investments because we thought it was important to get yeah. expertise and capital in. 
but really it was much more about building these local companies up you know, and providing them with capacity and access to, to markets and sort of the long slog which the, the Scaling yeah. Seeds Initiative, the, the big investment that we had with, with Agra that just concluded, uh, was really about building up seed companies and other kind of local technology companies. So really interesting to see the perception and the reality on the ground. I want to point out something that comes back to whole of government. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember being in Zambia uh, and talking to mm -hmm. the ambassador there and realizing, wow, this is so different to work on agriculture and food security issues when you have the State Department engaged. State yep. Department in the field and State Department here. Because it meant that, you know, we academics, you know, we, we, we tick off the policy. Yes, policies are a constraint, but the ambassadors, you know, can go and say, Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, what are you doing about your, your 2,500 seed regulations that are preventing anybody from, from making a living in this sector? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So it's not it's capital, but it's so much about policies, and I think USAID by itself has a very difficult time, you know, dealing with those policies. So the engagement of State Department in the field and back here has been so so transformative. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there a final question? We're here. Thank you, and thank you very much for the, for the panel. It's been extremely interesting. Um, my particular interest is in uh, remittances and in diaspora organizations, um, especially in, in regions that are um, post-conflict or nearing a post-conflict phase, one of the few organizations that's willing to invest in, uh, in that kind of area. Uh, are people who live abroad, who are you know, sending money home from relative safety. Um, how does Feed the Future engage with those groups in making sure that their investments are, are, are invested in, uh, in creating a more stable environment in, uh, in their home countries? So there's been a long history um, that, I mean, I know Jade and Julie can talk about, about engaging civil society in Feed the Future, and maybe one of you can talk about that. I'll just say that now that that you know, our leadership at USAID is very committed to diversifying our partner base and to engaging a wide range of partners who do have the types of advantages and expertise that you're talking about. And, and Feed the Future, of course, is a big part of that. I don't know if you want to talk about sort of the grassroots civil society engagement um, in Feed the Future since the beginning. Yeah, no, I mean, as, as I said at the beginning, I think civil society engagement, the engagement of NGOs, including the diaspora, is a critical part of the support behind Feed the Future. Yeah. And also one of the, the great tenets of Feed the Future was how do you make this about country priorities and not just yeah. about U.S. imposed priorities. And of course the diaspora community very much in, mm -hmm. in support of that, very much driving that as a reflection also of, of our, our uh, support of the Rome principles, for example, <coughs> development, effective development. I want to say, you know, my recent work in, in Nigeria, uh, not under Feed the Future, I've also seen the power of the diaspora in other areas. For example, you know, Nigeria has such a wealth of, 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 of trained folks who are starting to come back uh, and become the lightning rods for investment. Yeah. And I see, you know, that's a, there's a fantastic potential now for Feed the Future mm -hmm. to tap into those, those brains, you know, with their connections, right? And their, their savvy, their on the ground savvy. They can accomplish things I think that's very difficult for, for outsiders to accomplish. So I'm, I'm very optimistic and hopeful that, that, that Feed the Future and USAID more broadly will, will find a way to engage the diaspora more. Mm -hmm. Well, first, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. And uh, this has been a very engaging discussion, and the panel of the members of Congress before was very informative as well. Um, remember, there's a reception afterwards, so we'd like to keep the discussion going. So if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, we'll be around uh, to, to talk to, to you further. So please join me in thanking the panel for being here today.